Today's speaker, today's speaker is Michael Edmonds, Deputy Director of Library Archives Division at the Wisconsin Historical Society. He's a graduate from Harvard University and Simmons College. Michael has written a book about Wisconsin State Capitol Building, which turns 100 this year. He will share some stories about the people who shape Wisconsin from within the Capitol. We look forward to your presentation, Michael, and we have made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way to say thank you for speaking to us today. As we welcome him to the podium, I want to remind everyone, if time permits questions, please wait for the audience microphones. Michael. Thank you, Donna. It's nice to be back and see some familiar faces out there. Um, I thought that the most fun thing to do to honor the state capitol's 100th anniversary would be to tell some stories about people who've worked at the capitol. Um, some colorful stories about colorful people rather than give you a boring history lecture. Uh, this uh, program and the book that uh, will be for sale, I guess I can see it, is for sale out there afterwards, are part of a statewide celebration of the capitol centennial that was uh, established by the state legislature last year. There's a special 100th anniversary committee and there are lots of programs going on. Maybe some of you were at Concerts on the Square two or three weeks ago for that uh, centennial show. And then uh, Wisconsin Public Television will have a documentary out come November, I think it is, about the history of the Capitol. So uh, how many of you love the Capitol? I've worked in the Capitol. In there. Okay, so you'll want to watch out for that programming. Let's see, Jane, you said the clicker. Here's the clicker. No, that's a pen. Okay. All right. Um, before I go into stories about the people who worked at the Capitol and a little political history of Wisconsin, I want to put it all in context. Because when Europeans first settled here, Wisconsin was governed by a king, Louis XIV, the guy in the chair there. He built Versailles, and he was in charge of governing all of Canada, which included Wisconsin. And he had the right to do that because in the 1600s, everyone believed that the right to tell other people what to do descended from God to kings. It was called the divine right of kings. And it had been common sense for hundreds of years, and nobody questioned it until about 100 years later in the 1770s in Philadelphia when a, a small group of visionaries got together and decided that the right to rule did not descend from on high. They claimed, utopians that they were, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable, inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So what they did was they stood the world on its head. They said the right to govern does not come down from heaven. The right to govern rises up from the hearts and minds of the people. This was an amazing revolutionary idea that is as alive today as it was 250 years ago. Of course, no one living in Wisconsin in 1776 could have understood that idea because the only people here spoke Ho-Chunk, Menominee, or Ojibwe. There were a handful of Canadians living at Green Bay and Prairie du Chien, and they spoke only French. So this revolutionary idea took a while to get out here to the frontier. But over the next several decades, English-speaking Americans began moving this way, and finally by 1836, there were enough of them here that a government had to be set up. And on July 4th, 18. 36, the territory of Wisconsin was created, and a, Madison was chosen to be its capital. Now, those of you who know how Madison was chosen will understand when I say that's a separate tale of its own that time won't allow me to go into, but um, the large picture on the screen there shows the view up King Street about 1850, and the first capital is in the background there. It was built in uh, 1837. It actually took years to build. Uh, the materials were shoddy. The workmanship was bad. Nobody liked it. And uh, it fell down, pretty much, nearly fell down, after t only 20 years of use. And so in 1859, state officials said, we need a real capital. 
and they built another much grander one, which was supposedly fireproof. It was added onto in the 1880s, and a state-of-the-art fire suppression system was added in the 1890s. So it was ironic when on February 27th, 1904, most of that one burned down, which is the lower picture there. I assume you know, who, who, do most of you know the story of the Capitol fire? Raise your hands, no? Oh, I didn't include that because I figured it was fairly common knowledge. Um, all right, here we go, quick summary. It was supposed to be fireproof, but a gas jet, a gas flame that was left on for a nightlight, ignited a newly varnished ceiling on the second floor around three in the morning. The night watchman ran to get this modern hose that was coiled up throughout the building, get the nearest one, and ran to the fire and turned the valve and nothing came out. Because the water supply was hooked to Bascom Hill. And earlier in the day, the university had drained the reservoir to clean the system out. And just bad luck on that day, the fire broke out. <laughs> the photograph that you see at the lower left, the, it's actually a color lithograph based on a photograph, was taken before dawn around 4 a.m. And um, by then the fire was raging out of control. The governor at the time, Bob La Follette, was waked up and he came rushing from his home and for hours and hours uh, ran in and out of the burning building with other people trying to save paintings and furnishing in the archives of state government. But it was all to no avail because the, the building was about 80% destroyed. And so the people who had built Wisconsin uh, in 1904 when the fire happened, these are people in the moment, mainly in their 50s and 60s, said we need a new capital and it should be a tribute to this American exper experiment with self-government. It should be a monument to democracy. So they hired the nation's best known, most famous architect, the guy at the upper right with the mustache, George B. Post, to design the building that you know today, that we still have today. A Post was uh, in some ways a traditionalist, and so he built a very traditional building. In some ways a great visionary. He built the first skyscrapers, he built the first buildings in New York that, that had elevators. But he was in New York. And the building was a thousand miles away. So somebody had to oversee work on the ground. That job fell to Lou Porter, the lower photo there on the right, who was a Madison architect who had done local work. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright had apprenticed with him. And Lou Porter agreed to take on the job of overseeing the construction of the building that you love. If you have ever remodeled a bathroom or built your own home, imagine something a thousand-fold greater than that. Uh, this was the largest construction project in state history up to that point. More than 500 contractors bid on 125 different jobs, and on any given day, 30 or 40 of them were on site trying to carry out their contract or cut corners on it. Porter tolerated no deviation from the specifications. He obsessed about every detail. One observer recalled that, quote, Whatever the plan called for was carefully checked. And as he walked about observing what was going on, in his stoop-shouldered carriage, in his slow but very cautious watching, it seemed nothing escaped his eyes. Whatever the plan called for was carefully checked. Once when Porter suspected that a railing in a stairwell was not solid bronze, as the plans called for, he grabbed a hacksaw and he tore into it. And it turned out only to be bronze plated and it was sent back and it was replaced. This isn't in my notes, but as far as I know, the only time he deviated from the plans had to do with toilet seats. Because Post had designed bathrooms down to the level of every detail and the bathrooms had toilet seats that were complete circles. But Madison being a progressive city had just passed a public ordinance saying that Toilet seats had to have a notch cut in them, as we're used to today. And Porter decided that the city ordinance in that case overruled the architect's plans. Otherwise, everything went exactly according to plan. For more than a decade, Porter inspected every detail. He butted heads with engineers, faced down striking workers, and outwitted conniving politicians. But his every move was open to public scrutiny. He could never get away from his work. He lived in Monona, and when he went home at the end of the day, his work taunted him across the lake. He loved to sail, and on his rare days off, he would go out in his sailboat. There it was again, staring down at him. For more than a decade, he could not escape this stress, and he laid, literally worked himself to death 
He died of heart disease and kidney failure a few months after the building opened in 1917. He's buried over in uh, Forest Hill, and I think that uh, you should run over there and say thank you if you love the Capitol, because without his incredible work, more than a decade worth of work, we would not have the building we would. Now, the, the building um, opened in the summer of, or was finished, the construction was finished in the summer of 1917, but there was never any opening ceremony or opening celebration because the U.S. had just entered World War I in April, and Wisconsin residents were getting ready to send their sons and their husbands off to die in trenches in France. And so there was no opening celebration because of the war. During the next 18 months, while uh, the U.S. was in the war, women organized, whoop, Jane, can you bail me out here? Oh, never mind, another button did it. Women organized on the home front to support the war effort. They raised money, uh, packaged medical supplies, grew food, and they organized so effectively that they caught the attention of male politicians and policymakers for the first time. And when the war ended in November of 1918, all those women's organizations shifted their attention to securing the right to vote. Now, women had been trying to get the right to vote in Wisconsin since 1855. And the legislature turned down bill after bill after bill. In 1911, a statewide referendum um, got on the ballot with some of the propaganda for it you see at the upper left. The, the left-hand poster there, handbill, says, danger, women's suffrage would double the irresponsible vote. Which makes you wonder what the other half must have come from. But legislators and voters, all male, all turned down the... Um, the effort to secure the vote for women. So uh, women turned their attention to the US Congress and the 19th Amendment was passed and eventually ratified by all states. Wisconsin was the first state to ratify the, the constitutional amendment securing women the right to vote. Wisconsin legislators never approved votes for women. Well, when the 19th Amendment passed, many people felt it didn't go far enough. Wisconsin women had become a voting bloc, so the Republicans, who controlled state government in both houses and the Capitol, uh, and the governor's office, proposed an equal rights bill guaranteeing women, quote, equal pay for equal service regardless of sex, and demanded, quote, that in all matters men and women should be on a basis of equality. That was too much for many male politicians. One assemblyman protested, quote, this bill will result in coarsening the fiber of woman. It will take her out of her proper sphere. We all know where that was, right, in the home. Another complained, quote, why a woman could establish her residence separate and apart from that of her husband. Opponents protested loudly until supporters of equal rights threatened a roll call vote in which each legislator would have to go on record opposing or supporting equal rights. And with every new female vi voter back home able to see how he voted, Male law lawmakers changed their tune. On July 11, 1921, Wisconsin enacted the nation's first Equal Rights Act, first Equal Rights Law. It remains today the only one on the books in the country. Wisconsin women were soon serving on juries, renting their own homes, running their own businesses, taking civil service exams, and even campaigning for office. At the lower right there, you see the first female legislators, three rural school teachers elected to the assembly in 1924. One of them remembered afterwards, the men didn't resent us too much. <laughs> During the years between the wars, one of the best loved people at the Capitol was Sam Pierce in the governor's office. His parents had been slaves in Louisiana and he had grown up in the South. As a teenager, he got a job as a Pullman porter, which was a kind of servant on long distance railroad routes. And in 1905, he was assigned to the Chicago Minneapolis route. This brought him into daily contact with Wisconsin business leaders and politicians. And um, in 1905, he moved his family, including his elderly mother, he was shown in the other photo there, to Madison. They lived on Willie Street on the Near East Side. Uh, she went on to be the oldest living resident of Wisconsin, uh, living until 1944. In 1922, Republican Governor John Blaine asked Sam Pierce if he would be a receptionist in the governor's office. His primary responsibility was to protect the chief executive from unwanted visitors. Standing more than six feet tall and always dressed impeccably in a dark blue suit, 
Pierce gently defended the governor from intruders. One federal official recalled, he had a genius for avoiding offense. I called there three times, went in the front door, Sam and I talked, and as we were talking, we moved about. Sooner or later, I found myself going out of the entrance. <laughs> he wasn't trying to get me into the governor's office, he was quietly oozing me out of the place. A Capitol reporter remembered a gentle pat, a whisk of his hand at an imaginary fleck of dust, sent many of them away in a congenial mood, even if they had failed to see the governor. Sam Pierce did this for five governors throughout the roaring 20s and the bleakest days of the Great Depression. When he was not at work at the Capitol, Pierce was a leader in Madison's small black community. Residents brought disputes to him for arbitration. He spoke out against the city's racist accommodations and housing policies, and he worked to create a neighborhood community center with adult, edu excuse me, adult education programs. When Pierce died in 1936, five different governors paid tribute to him in the press, and obituaries appeared in papers all over the state. He did a great deal of good, the La Crosse newspaper wrote, and made a great many friends. How much more can a governor do, or a president, or the ruler of the world's greatest empire? As you can tell, we're doing about one per decade here. Right? In the fall of 1942, Spike Loomis, a rising star in the Progressive Party, won the gubernatorial election by a landslide. He had been attorney general in the 1920s and refused to enforce the prohibition laws that made him popular. Then in the 1930s, he headed the state's rural electrification program that brought power and light to farms all over the state. So when he ran for governor in 1942, he easily defeated Milwaukee millionaire and incumbent governor Julius Heil. I think also, if you think of it, it's 1942, World War II has broken out. No politician could have a worse name than Heil. But after winning the election, before inauguration, Loomis abruptly died of a heart attack. The state constitution didn't address this situation. Nobody knew what to do. It said that the lieutenant governor steps in if a governor passes away in office, but Loomis had never been sworn in. Voters had just thrown out the sitting governor and the sitting lieutenant governor, but they hadn't endorsed the incoming lieutenant governor, Walter Goodland, for the state's top office. He wasn't even in the same party as Loomis, so nobody knew what to do. It went to the Supreme Court, and they looked at the constitutional debates of 1847-48 to see what the constitutional intent might have been, and they looked at an 1855 case, worth a story of its own, when two competing gub gubernatorial candidates both claimed to win, and both were sworn in. <laughs> we'll go there another time. The Supreme Court concluded that the incoming lieutenant governor chosen by the voters should be the next chief executive. So 80-year-old Walter Goodland at the lower left there of Racine was sworn in as governor. He became quickly a sort of lovable father figure or maybe grandfather figure, and he won re-election easily in 1944 and 1946 as Republicans cemented their control of the Capitol. During Goodland's last term, a handful of young liberals decided to revive the Democratic Party. This was a crazy idea, because Democrats had been almost invisible since the Civil War, and Republicans had run Wisconsin as a one-party state for almost a century. That's because of the Civil War. The Republicans were on the Union, the Northern side. Democrats generally supported the South, and for two, three generations afterwards, no Democrat had power in northern states. In Wisconsin, the, the division was between two factions in the Republican Party, one more traditional and one that became the progressive movement of Bob La Follette. But at this time, the late 40s, the Democratic Party didn't exist really, recalled strategist Bill Cherkasky. Even though there was a Democratic president, Harry Truman, there was no Democratic Party in Wisconsin at all. That left a vacuum for the young upstarts to fill. One of them, Ellen Proxmire, who's uh, in the large photo holding her husband's hand up in the air above the, the Proxmire Democrat senator photo. I think she just died a few weeks ago or a few months ago in Washington. Ellen Proxmire recalled, quote, it was like a cell almost. 
because these were all people who were interested in the cause, but there was no formal organization, no money. Women were crucial to the birth of the Democratic Party. We all loved it, she continued. We socialized together. We all knew each other. We all know each other's children. We had this small crummy office over a bakery, I think, and Fran Letcher and I were the two paid employees for the, it was called the Democratic Organizing Committee then. Its candidates were returning World War II vets who believed simultaneously in free enterprise and a strong government that would look out for the common people. Future governors Gaylord Nelson, Pat Lucy, and John Reynolds all launched their careers from this 1940s fringe group, along with Senator Proxmire. These were fresh new faces, faces, Cherkasky recalled. Young people, very attractive, good-looking, with progressive values. They were not way out in left field somewhere. They campaigned hard, and I think the people grew to like them. In fact, voters liked them so much that by 1950, there were 32 Democrats sitting under the Capitol Dome. And for the next two decades, the party won most statewide and national offices. In the 1950s, racial discrimination was perfectly legal all across the country in housing, employment, education, and public accommodations. Across the nation, most act public activities were segregated by race. It was not just a Southern phenomenon. Some Wisconsin communities were called sundown towns because they had laws that prohibited African Americans from staying inside the city limits after dark. I did a little research this morning on this. 58 of our 72 county seats were sundown towns in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. The, the phenomenon lasted into the 60s in some parts of the state. During the 1950s, seeing the success of nonviolent boycotts and sit-ins by Martin Luther King in the South, the Wisconsin NAACP decided to challenge segregation in Wisconsin. Redlining and overt racism had already created black ghettos in the state's major cities. And the Wisconsin legislature repeatedly rejected bills that would have guaranteed fair housing. The legislature's only black member in 1961, Isaac Coggs, said, we have a case of Dixiecrats. The Mason-Dixon line is just south of Wisconsin Avenue. So young NAACP lawyer Lloyd Barbie, who's in the small photo to the right, and, and he's also in the other photo, organized a sit-in in the rotunda by 700 demonstrators. They followed the nonviolent tactics used at Southern lunch counters, sitting quietly for two weeks, 24 hours a day, talking to everyone who would listen about the need for a fair housing law. On August 14th, they left the building peacefully after calling the entire state's attention to the injustice. But Wisconsin legislatures, legislators refused to pass a fair housing bill anyway. Reform would not come until the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968 forced local officials and businesses to end racial discrimination. Barbie, meanwhile, ran successfully for the assembly, where he served as one of the state's leading champions of basic human rights until 1977. Some of you will remember this guy, right? Yeah. In 1978, UW Stevens Point Chancellor Lee Dreyfus got disgusted at the way officials in Madison treated the rest of the state. Although he'd never held elected office, Dreyfus joined the Republican Party and launched a maverick campaign for governor. Calling himself a Republicrat, he had almost no name recognition and no money, and his own party refused to endorse him. But he carried on a colorful campaign, riding across the state in a school bus painted to look like a load of load, excuse me, painted to look like a locomotive with a group of high school musicians always clad in the trademark red vest you see in the portrait there. He titled his campaign newsletter, The Vest and the Brightest. <laughs> he proved to be exactly what voters were looking for. And after beating the Republicans' hand-picked candidate in the primary, he defeated incumbent Democratic Governor Marty Schreiber in November. On election night, no one is surpri was more surprised than Dreyfus himself. Just nine short months ago, the odds against this were astronomical, he told the press. Asked if she were surprised, his wife Joyce said, I expected exactly what is happening, total chaos. <laughs> Dreyfus focused on reforming Wisconsin's tax, co tax code, reducing the cost and the size of government, and keeping it as transparent as possible. He made his staff share a large office without any walls, which was kept open to reporters and the public. 
He's also credited with giving the state capital its unofficial nickname when he casually referred to Madison as 30 miles, 30 square miles surrounded by reality. The phrase stuck and the number of miles has increased as the city has grown ever since. After one term in 1980, Dreyfus decided he'd accomplished what he set out to do and chose not to seek re-election. But before leaving office, he signed a bill protecting gay people from discrimination in employment, housing, and public accommodations. It was the nation's first gay rights law. To conclude, I'd like to turn to the issue of bipartisanship and polarization. Obviously, we've, we live in deeply divided times, um, driven home by the events of this weekend that Donna referred to. But we're not the first generation to live in divided times. Pro and anti-Vietnam factions in the 1960s, anti-communist crusaders and old left socialists in the 40s, Milwaukee businessmen and Marxist union leaders in the 30s, progressives and stalwarts a century ago, they all faced off in the capital. And their differences were often even greater than ours are today. But even at the height of the vicious McCarthy era in the early 50s, opponents managed to work together. Democratic Governor Naylord, Gaylord Nelson, on the left there, recalled that, quote, fraternizing between Republicans and Democrats in those days was not seen as a treasonable offense. Speaking of his Republican adversary, Mel Laird, on the right, Nelson continued, he would contest things vigorously, but he was always civil. He had strong convictions and great integrity, decency, and compassion. We would debate all day long and argue on the floor, and then at sundown sensibly move to the nearest pub to continue our friendly disputes into the night. For a hundred years, the Capitol Dome has been big enough to accommodate a broad spectrum of conflicting opinions. Let's hope that it continues to shelter a fearless sifting and winnowing of ideas from all sides of every question for a long time to come. That's exactly what the Founding Fathers had in mind. And whatever else the, case, the capital may be, art museum, tourist destination, office building, it's first and foremost a symbol of the American experiment in self-government. If you enjoyed these stories, they're taken from this book. Uh, there are a hundred more, um, and I encourage you to pick up a copy either when you leave or down the block at the Historical Museum or just order it from the evil empire on your phone. <laughs> You'll enjoy it. Thank you, and I think we have time for questions. Hi, Michael. Thanks very much for coming. And of course, Wisconsin State Historical Society Press is the world's greatest publisher. We're, just for those of you who don't know, he's <laughs> under contract for a book. Uh, first, first of all, to um, fill in one uh, bit of information, before he was a statewide NAACP official, Lloyd Barbie was the city of Madison NAACP official, and in that role was helpful uh, and instrumental in getting the city of Madison to enact the state's first fair housing law in 1963. Uh, my question is, since we're talking about the building, can you explain, uh, state definitively, that the gold lady on top of the big white dome is not forward and is not Mrs. Rennebaum looking for the next <laughs> location for a drugstore, but is in fact called Wisconsin. The statue is called Wisconsin. There was another statue, very much like it, that was called forward, and that's now down at the Wisconsin Historical Society on campus. A replica is on the square, and that's why there's so much confusion. You're welcome. Have a good afternoon. A badger is on Wisconsin's head. Yes. Is there, can you add anything, Stu? Would you say I simplified things too much somewhere? The reason the statue is pointing east is to greet the, the, the dawn of the new day. And that was by decision of George Post, I believe, who was the architect. And, and some people were saying pointed towards the university. Some were saying pointed west towards, you know, manifest destiny. And they decided to point it over the water to greet the new day. And uh, John Nolan thought that was the appropriate uh, Great idea. way to, to locate it. That's great. I think uh, way in the back there was a question first. Where does Belmont fit in? <laughs> oh, um, that was that. The question well, there, halfway back, was um, where does Belmont fit in? When Wisconsin was named a territory on July 4th, 1836, Henry Dodge was appointed governor and his first duty was to call a constitutional convention so the state could have some laws and decide where its capital should be. 
1836, there was one fur, white fur trader in Milwaukee. There was no one in Madison. And the center of population was the southwestern part of the state where lead was being mined. Belmont, which is a few miles east of Platteville or Dodgeville, Platteville, um, was a central location for all the delegates to come to. And for about six weeks that fall, they fought over all kinds of questions, including where to put government. So technically speaking, it's the first capital. The next session of the legislature actually met in Iowa, because that was part of Wisconsin territory at the time. So the second capital isn't even in Wisconsin. The first Madison capital was the third capital. Um, and then we've had three here in Madison. Yes, in the red shirt, way in the back. I thought when you told a bipartisanship story involving Senator Nelson, you'd tell the famous uh, Nelson uh, Oscar Rennebaum story. You, I don't know that story. Tell it to okay. us. Okay. The governor. This is in the book, The Man from Clear Lake, so we know it's yep. true. <laughs> it's a great book. Bill Christopherson's. Gaylord Nelson was a state senator from Madison, and he went into the governor's office and met with Oscar Rennebaum. And as it got toward five o'clock, the governor suggested that they go over to the Madison Club and have a drink. And Senator Nelson said he couldn't because he'd promised his wife he'd be home by 6 o'clock. And the governor said, well, that's no problem. We'll just call her up and I'll talk to her. So Nelson dials the phone and hands the phone to the governor. And the governor said, this is Oscar Rennebaum. I'd like to you know, have your husband for an hour or so while we, we work an issue out. And Mrs. Nelson is said to have responded, Governor Rennebaum, my ass. You tell that son of a bank to get home right away. <laughs> and allegedly, every time they saw each other, Miss Carrie Lee Nelson and Oscar Rennebaum, that was those were the first words out of his mouth. Uh -huh. Governor uh -huh. Rennebaum, my ass. <laughs> Bravo. See, I didn't want to go places like that. That you know, that's not history. That's gossip. And anyway, right here in the front, please. Uh, can we get a microphone yep. here to uh, Bajid? I was told to make sure you guys had microphones. Apparently there are people out in virtual space listening or something. And just uh, one more uh, historical point. Uh, connection of our Rotary Club or with the building. When the building uh, is, was for renovation, they contact me and University of Wisconsin, me, yours truly identified the dyes and paints that has been used originally that we can keep the original uh, colors in renovating the building. So I work with the architects and those group, of course, free of a charge service to our Towards. building. That restoration project ran yeah. from 87 to 2001, yeah. cost 20 times what the original building cost. But um, it is an amazing accomplishment. Yes, just for yeah. the people to know. Yeah. Another question, left or right? I meant in the room, not politically. Over here, please. Uh, the microphone's making its way to you. Is there a follow-up story about uh, the fire? in that they were trying to bring water by rail from Milwaukee to fight. So maybe you want to address yeah. that. Yeah, when it was clear a few hours in that Madison could not put this fire out by itself, um, neighboring cities, firefighters came. Milwaukee, the Milwaukee crews made it in 90 minutes by rail. And they brought water with them because they had heard that the, the water supply was precarious. Um, and that all froze on the way here. That's what you're alluding to, right? It's not useful. Um, from the accounts I have read, water hoses were eventually run down to Lake Monona, where Monona Terrace is now, and it was lake water that put out the fire. Carol? Oh, thank you, right here. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the reason Wisconsin got its uh, passage of the 19th Amendment to Washington so quickly was because one of the women a woman named Ada James, uh, hus uh, father was in the legislature. And so she pleaded with him to hand deliver it. And there uh, often is a little disclaimer that Kentucky was about the same time, I think it's Kentucky, uh, someone, 
Okay, Melanie says it was Kentucky. <laughs> but in fact, because Ada James' father was willing to make the trip, Wisconsin got there first. It was a matter of hours. Anyone else? Well, thank you. Um, In the rotunda right now is a large exhibit on the history of the Capitol that the Historical Society put together. And um, when you can't face work at some point in the middle of an afternoon, waltz over there and, and take in more of these stories. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Edmonds. Have a wonderful rest of the week. We are adjourned.